Okay, thanks so much um, for the invitation. Thanks for, for, to the organizers for making me part of this program. I'm very excited to be here and it's very excited also to be here for an extended period of time. So um, that I hope will be very, you know, fruitful with many new collaborations. So far, all the tutorials, I almost had no clue about uh, um, before going in, but I learned a lot already. Um, and I'm kind of trying to um, show you a little bit what I'm interested in these days and give you an overview of related um, work in, in an area that tries to connect um, deep neural networks to ideas from ordinary differential equations or partial differential equations. So one could argue that you know there are some you know, physics that are built into neural network models that are not necessarily being used for physics, general purpose neural network models. And I, that's been an area that uh, I've been engaged in for the last two years or so, uh, and it's been growing actually quite rapidly and with many collaborations and many, of, many other people also uh, who have contributed to that growing field of work. So today uh, I want to kind of give you an overview, since it's a tutorial, over a few interesting things that's happened, uh, some things that I find exciting, um, and um, then hopefully we'll use these, what is it, like four months or so, or wh however long we are gonna be here for it for, for more in-depth discussions. Um, so my agenda for today is that I first need to uh, build a bridge from deep learning um, to optimal control. So one of these fields is like uh, in every newspaper these days, um, that's basically my favorite field of optimal control, of course. Um, and the other one is, you know, this uh, niche thing that people have been working on since the 50s. No, no just kidding. But, uh, but no, I mean, you put, uh, actually both fields have been receiving quite a lot of attention from the scientific community. And so it makes sense to kind of combine them, but it's not an obvious thing. So I want to build that bridge first. Then I want to show you a few ways in which you can exploit that knowledge. Um, and one is, so we will basically make a neural network, take it and make it a continuous object. So there won't be like n layers and stuff like that. It will be a continuous thing. And then one thing you could use this continuous thing for is to analyze it. And uh, so one question that we always ask ourselves in optimal control or related like parameter estimation problems of physical processes is stability. So if I change my data slightly, will I get basically the same result or will I get different results? Um, and you could ask the question, when is deep learning uh, stable and when is, so to say, estimating the weights a well-posed problem? Um, I have to warn you that the answer is not so positive. Um, but on the other hand, you can be constructive too and you can uh, bring over ideas to stabilize deep neural networks that are not stable. And that's basically what we are in. And then, of course, the, there's numerical methods um, that is tied also into that. So that's one of my main area of interest. Um, and there is uh, an argument to be made that how you build your network will, de will uh, influence the properties of that network, both in the training, but also in the prediction, and hopefully also in the generalization. So can we use kind of things from numerical analysis um, to a priori say, hey, this network may not be too stable, may not be such a good idea, uh, better try this one. Um, and then tomorrow, um, I'll take it, I'll ramp it up a little bit more and go from ODs to PDs, um, which is a, um, uh, it, it's a new interpretation that is, uh, that holds for neural networks, like convolutional neural networks, uh, mostly. And uh, then we will bro break down, like if you are a PDE person, then you like to break down PDEs into different uh, categories. Uh, for example, parabolic, hyperbolic PDEs, and you can kind of establish that notion also for CNNs in that way. But that's for tomorrow. Yeah, so um, let's first of all you know, look at uh, deep neural networks. And I, I will say, so my talk will be slightly different than the previous talks, like Frank's tutorials. Uh, I will use some of the things that Frank has talked about. I will also use a draw from many things that Steve has talked about, because he talked about dynamical systems, and that's where we are headed. Um, but I, to be honest with you, I was very confused in the beginning uh, of my machine learning career by those pictures. And also it doesn't, I mean, this is kind of representation of neural networks as intuitive as it now even feels to me. Um, uh, maybe show of hands, so who thinks, that, uh, who, who is very good at reading those pictures? Yeah, probably many, right? Uh, I'm not so much. So um, I like linear algebra. Who else likes linear algebra? Okay, so the way that I'm going to write uh, these objects as we move forward is like so. Okay, so no more graph plots. 
uh, I want to just quickly make the case that I can capture exactly the same things with linear algebras. Uh, within, in, within the framework of linear algebra. So for example, when my forward, so y's are going to be my features, um, and my new features yj plus one, if they are obtained by an affine transformation of yj and the nonlinearity here, then these uh, funny little arrows here that say that this feature is connected to say all of the, those four features, um, basically you can, you can discover that by looking at the spy plot of your K matrix. So spy plot is basically uh, showing you the sparsity pattern of that matrix. If you force the matrix to be sparse, so to, have not, to not have an entry in the uh, IJ's position, then you say there is no arrow from neuron I to neuron J or something like that. Okay, so you can capture all that. Um, and then also I have a hard time capturing these uh, pretty different, so this first one is like the single layer perceptron of, uh, of a neural network. So it's a very simple kind of model, a fine transformation on linearity, there you go, okay. Um, and of course, I mean, I, sh I should say maybe so, so KJ and BJ, so the, the matrix parameterizing that transformation and the bias, they are unknown, they are, they, they are the weights that you want to learn in the training. And you can even also um, go, go um, a little bit down and you can say, well, this KJ here is only parameterized by a few weights, so say a convolution kernel and stuff like that. Okay, great. Um, However, like I mean, this single layer perceptron model, so you could stack many of those layers and you have a universal approximation theorem and so on, but they become quite tricky to train. So what I'm more interested in is architectures like this one here. So um, you just add a yj plus here. Um, and then you could, you could even like have a yj plus at every layer or say at every other layer and stuff like that. So these are ResNets residual neural networks that I'm gonna talk about uh, a little bit later. But there's a whole zoo of models. I think there literally is a model zoo someplace um, that you can think about um, phrasing uh, neural networks and modeling neural networks. Um, so we want to use kind of um, these ODEs and, 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 so, and mathematical ideas to kind of steer our uh, guide us in, the, in, this, in this model zoo and maybe even contribute a little bit to the diversity in there. Um, but yeah, you know, um, other than that, you know, neural networks are not so new. Um, they just became more usable these days. Um, and um, great. So let's maybe define a very primitive um, learning problem with a neural network. So for me, I mean, like the architectures and so on that we are building, they are not limited to supervised classification. But it was our gateway problem into this whole thing, and it gives me just uh, you know an, an opportunity to draw some some simple pictures, uh, especially for people who um, who still uh, are a little bit new to this machine learning phenomenon. So here's some training data. So I have some uh, 2D feature space, and the points are labeled blue and red. Okay, um, the goal of classification is that we want to classify the data, um, and at my disposal. Um, I think about having, say, a linear classifier. Of course, you know, a kernel uh, regression would eat this data set alive, and a nice coordinate transform also would, would really do that very well. But let's say I only have a linear classifier. So then what I can do is I can draw a line, maybe in the middle through, through the whole point cloud, and I have a f about a 50% chance of getting things right here. So the way I think about the neural network now is to basically transform the feature space or to learn an embedding, or um, you, can, you can have all these, these uh, other words for it. Um, so to shift basically these, these features around, maybe we we've, uh, shift them around like so. Um, and we have now the network, which is parameterized by the Ks and Bs, and then we have the classifier that is uh, parameterized by the mu and uh, by W and, and mu, that's uh, uh, building the hyperplane. Um, and they work together to minimize a loss function that me measures a classification error, some regularity, and some activation function. And say at, after the end of this process, you may get a, a propagated feature set like this, which you can now easily uh, classify, um, like so. And then based on this classification, you can say what is blue, what is red. 
and you can propagate that uh, information backward into your feature space. So that will be the, your classification result then. Um, but it's really these two players. So you have the network and you have the classifier. Um, that is maybe a little bit awkward of a notation. So if you're used to machine learning, then um, typically the output of the network would directly give you the predicted label. So if, if, if you prefer that, then just think about the W and the mu as the last fully connected layer, which has no nonlinearity. So, uh, I, I mean, like intuitively and also algorithmically, oftentimes it makes sense, though, to single those variables out. Because it turns out from an optimization perspective that uh, allows you to play a lot of uh, tricks that you otherwise couldn't do. Um, okay, so great. So that's uh, just, you know, setting the stage. Um, now let's talk about residual neural networks. So residual neural networks are neural networks that look like so. So you have your new features are given by the old features from the previous layer plus and then whatever you can write down here. So this is kind of like a simplified uh, double layer. So like two single layer perceptrons, but I removed the outer nonlinearity here uh, just for, for simplicity. You can add it if you'd like. Um, okay, so what's new? What's new is this guy, so this YJ plus. It's called a skip connection also. Um, and it's called residual neural network because now the, the learned part here just tries to learn the update made to YJ, okay? Um, and it's been, I think, incredibly successful. I mean, it's not that old of a method. It's about five years old, maybe. Um, but it's been widely adopted and has, many, has crushed many um, classification tasks in the beginning. And now I, th I think they also used in other, uh, other domains, although I'm not the expert on that. Um, so, so that's a, that's a ResNet. And um, I left a little bit of a gap here because I want to fill the gap with uh, one of the major ideas of this talk, that is to put an H there. So H is a, uh, we call it a step size. It's a parameter bigger than zero. Um, and I think it just belongs there. So if you are a numerical analyst, if you look at the ResNet, uh, the original paper, you, you wonder, why is there no H? Um, I think it's pretty, pretty clear. So then uh, you take over the YJ to the other side, divide by H, and take a limit. And then you may argue that the ResNet is a forward Euler discretization of this ordinary differential equation. Um, so it's an initial value problem. Y0 denotes your input feature. And then the input feature gets trans transformed by this dynamical system um, with the goal of making all the features separable. Okay? Um, and now, actually, uh, we can look, for example, at what happened in our example in the feature space by playing this as a, view, as, as a video. So since it's a dynamical system, I think Steve already laid the groundwork for that. We can always show videos. So today there will be actually a few videos, nothing as spectacular as he has. But um, you see, this is um, kind of the way we got to this nicely separable um, output here. OK, you want to play it again? And I should make a few comments actually here. Since that, that, that's the movement of, of the bit ODE that you have. So that is the first thing. So that is so here to generate that video, you need to t first train the neural network. So this is not after the, this is done after the training, and then for the trained network, you can make this video by playing each. So each frame, so to say, is a layer of the of the network, and that is what we reveal here is the hidden states or the hidden features. So I'm, uh, I'm very much a proponent uh, of uh, looking at hidden features. They're actually really interesting sometimes. I can tell you also something about your, your model and what it's doing. OK, so we train first. And then in the end, um, in this case, actually, we end up with a very nice and smooth uh, dynamic that transforms the feature space. Um, so is this not really a resonant where you have different parameters for every layer? Or you exactly. Have parameters or yeah. So here we did kind of um, the very naive thing first to say, OK, every so maybe we can have this. I wanted to spare this discussion for later, but maybe we'll have it now. So it's not so clear to me if you, if you look at this uh, problem here, what is now a layer? And I would argue there are two types of layers. So first of all, I think about, say, if you discretize that ODE, then you will have uh, Ys at a few time points. But not at every of those time points do you need to introduce weights. So you could have a grid for the weights, or even keep the weights constant. 
uh, but still you would have probably a few more than one layer for the Ys to solve this ODE at least uh, to into reasonable accuracy. Um, so then that begs the question, and I don't, I'm not in a position to make a decision now for you, but what is the layer it becomes a little bit more tricky to discuss. Um, but here we did the obvious thing, so we kind of uh, discretize this whole thing um, with, uh, with an equidistant time steps, and at each step we put a weight vector, okay. So how many weight vectors do you have? Um, honestly, I don't recall for this one. Um, maybe a thousand or so. Maybe less. Um, so, I mean, we, we, uh, tomorrow actually I'll show you some more large scale examples where if you pull the right tricks, you can have even on a single GPU a thousand layers for image classification. But you need to do some work um, for that. Yeah? So, are the features always uh, two dimensions in the studio? No. Is there some hidden latency? Yes. So, here's now for the, for the careful viewers. Um, if you know ODEs, then you know that under some assumptions on whatever happens on the right hand side, um, two particles in this, or two features here should never overlap. Okay? Um, so in this video, I kind of went, I think, to four dimensions and I show you only a two dimensional projection or to three. Um, and I have a slide for that actually also. But anyway, just to keep some notation, so the theta, which are the weights, um, and they bundle all the k's and the b's. They are time dependent in principle. You can make them smooth or constant or whatever. Um, and um, then you know you get your ODE here. And um, I will also touch on that later. So this ODE here now uh, seems to have been adopted the name of neural ODEs. But I want to just make the point, it's still just an ODE. So everything you know about ODEs also applies to neural ODEs. It doesn't seem to me for now that it's a completely different, different animal. Uh, but uh, we can talk more about that later. So here is a kind of, um, to, to touch on, 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 on the point of dimensionality here. Um, so since we know that an ODE is, so in, like an ODE in a two-dimensional feature space here is not going to be able to, to change the topology of the set. So it's not going, it's guaranteed not to be able to do the job. So here I added this because um, these uh, smart people here pointed that out right away after I showed them the video. They were very irritated. And so they motivated me to make an example for that. So, um, so I made a ResNet uh, again for, for the same point. But this time I made the ResNet stay in two dimensions. And actually one of the assumptions in ResNet is the number of channels or neurons is the same in each layer. Just has to be. There's no way around that so easily. Um, okay, so we stayed in two dimensions. I trained the heck out of that network um, to kind of achieve a propagation like so. So this does not look as pretty as what I showed you before. Um, but it gets almost 100% accuracy, and it even generalizes fairly well. But you see that the network, or the, the optimization here, is really smart in leaving a kind of a blue channel in here. So it did not really change the topology of the set. And I will say, I had to work really hard to make this example work. The optimization really gave me a hard time uh, and it gave me a very hard notice that this is not a good model, this is not a good way of doing things. But here we can maybe use some intuition from physics. So if you were a regular person needed to make a, make a classification out of this data set and all I give you is a linear classifier and you can choose the dimension, I think the first thing maybe you can come up with is, okay, so let's take this 2D feature uh, place send it over to one of these printers here, print it out on a sheet of paper. Okay, so what do I do then with a sheet of paper? Maybe I bend it. Uh, okay, I need to practice the bend a little bit. But if I bend it just right, I can easily slice it through. And this is actually what happens when you go in three dimensions. So here's again the same data set, but I just added a zero in the, in the third feature. Um, then this gets bent slightly and even pulled away. Um, quite a lot, and you see that the classification result here also looks, I mean, probably looks even better. And the optimization was way, way, way easier. I mean, uh, um, so, so that is kind of a blessing of dimensionality. So in American analysis, we're often very afraid when things become bigger, but in machine learning, I think it's, it's common practice also to make neural network architectures bigger rather than smaller. And surprisingly, you, you discover that you can fit better and more easily. Um, okay. So, and then you don't need really to change the topology because you just need to bend your sheet of paper a little bit and, and nothing, no one gets hurt, okay? Um, 
Okay, so, so now, since we basically have this learning problem with an ODE in there, that begs to point out some, some similarities to, um, people have, to what people have studied in what's called optimal control. Um, or parameter estimation is a very related field. So where you want to identify parameters of your dynamical system based on data. Um, and you could draw pictures like so. So you could have some input features, um, not nicely arranged um, in the terms of uh, easy classification. Um, and then you could have controls here. So maybe you have a few controls like one, two, three, four, five. Um, and then those controls kind of uh, tell the feature where in which direction to move. And you could track those, those um, features then through, the time, through time. And here I, I put this picture because uh, clearly, I mean, you could have more time steps in the integration of, this, uh, of the forward model than you have controls and still probably be able to fit really well. And uh, we've been um, like very busy, very excited about uh, kind of marrying these two different communities. Um, optimal control and deep learning because uh, there are many simil similar problems in optimal control. One is the trajectory problem. You want to find the best way from here to there. That seems very much related if your, if your model now becomes a ResNet. Um, I have a background in what's called image registration. So you are, you are given one image and another image and you want to find point-to-point -point correspondences. Turns out if you, if you look at the algorithms under the hood, they also tend to become much, much more similar now. Um, you could also go into, say, robust optimal control, which may give new insight into generalization. Um, and um, here's basically the big, pic uh, the small picture. Uh, what we what we do? So we take this discrete ResNet, we make it a continuous problem, and then we go back to some discretization at some point. And that discretization you may think about as an architecture. Because that now has like n layers and stuff like that, and connections and all the way through. But um, in creating that architecture, we use what we know about the continuous system, and we may even change the continuous system so that we know that we can apply um, a, a numerical method that has certain properties. Yeah? So, what's the connection with optimal transport? Yeah, with optimal transport, it's, it's quite similar. So in optimal transport, you have a, an initial density and you have a target density, and you want to tune the velocity so that this gets mapped to there. And the dynamics in that case, okay, is a continuity equation. It's not like a neural network, so there's more physics in there. Um, and in, neural, in, 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 old, in uh, deep learning, you don't actually know the target, um, the target density at all, but you, but you know that you want the target density to have certain properties, namely be easily classifiable. So there are you know, similar things, like um, if you write down numerical algorithms, for example, that are applied for optimal control, um, we have used some of those with success also for training deep neural networks. Um, so there, I mean, you know, it's not one-to-one -one mapping for, to either of these, but it's, a light, uh, but it's you know, readings that uh, you can do uh, in order to maybe improve deep learning and also the other way around to learn what people have, or to take what people have developed for deep neural networks and then bring them over to that area. Um, yeah, and so some, just to give you an overview of uh, what has happened here, um, so it's a very recent uh, field that has been, or a recent group of people, I would say. It's not a field. I mean, like a group of, of researchers who have uh, been very excited about these ideas. So this is a very incomplete list of, of some works that I, that I like uh, in this area. So first of all, there are a few papers about uh, deep neural networks as dynamical systems or as stochastic dynamical systems. So, so these ones here were, were kind of the first uh, works uh, pointing out the obvious uh, that basically a ResNet you could interpret as an ODE. Um, and then here in this paper, um, there is a new maximal principle. So that is a, like a new theory for this optimal control problem that you get in your network and also new algorithms for how to solve it beyond SGD and, uh, uh, and, and that. Uh, and in this paper, I also want to highlight um, because it's uh, by a UCLA group, um, but also because it's interesting. So um, they take the ResNet, which is a dynamical system, and they make it a stochastic dynamical system, and uh, show actually quite impressive results in terms of the generalization that you get from there. And it's a very simple method. If you, if you think about roughly speaking, you take the usual ResNet, and in each step you add some noise. 
OK, now there is analysis going on. What noise you pick and how you actually deal with it in the back propagation. But they actually show really, really nice results in there. Um, there has been some work on numerical time integrators, because of course forward Euler is not the only time integrator that there is in dynamical systems. Uh, it's a gateway, so you can look at, uh, at those works if you like. Um, mo probably the most, uh, like, uh, uh, the, the work that get, got the most attention so far is what's called the neural ODE, um, where the idea is uh, not to pick any time integrator, but use a black box method uh, that is, that is uh, uh, that is out there. I'll comment on, on, on that a little bit. Um, then there are some you know, really optimal control papers um, out there. I will touch a little bit on this work. Um, and these works are kind of, I mean, actually it's interesting if you, if you have read the neural ODE paper. Uh, who has? Okay. Then my, my re reading recommendation is to read also this paper. Um, and you get a really nice contrast um, what uh, like 50 years of optimal control research can tell you about uh, the new OD paper. Um, and I, I have one slide or so about that. Um, and then there are some PDVE motivated approaches, but that, those ones will leave for tomorrow. Um, and we are kind of the lone wolves in there. Um, so anyway. So uh, let's talk a little bit about optimal control. So we changed the learning problem now by replacing this constraint you know, with a continuous ODE. Okay? And now I think TensorFlow, PyTorch, MATLAB, whatever you want to use, has a hard time dealing with this problem. So we need to do something to make this problem actually solvable again. Um, and there's been a lot of work in optimal control. So the most common thing, by the way, is, um, is like this. We call it uh, to go to the reduced formulation. So you see here that this, the loss function or the objective function only depends on y at time t, big T. It's an arbitrary number that I pick as being the final time of the, of the differential equation, say 1 or so. Um, but it only depends on this state. And if I give you a y0 and I give you all the, the theta, so with all the k's and the b's and all that stuff, you can just integrate the ODE backward in time and you get the solution. So it's a constraint you can eliminate. Okay? So that's the most common uh, uh, way of, of dealing with the problem. So you just uh, lump this theta in here and say that that is the solution of the ODE at time, at time big T. Okay? Um, but still, you want to use now some optimization tools, and typically they depend on gradients. So you need to be able to, to uh, take a gradient of, of, of this guy. There are two ways you could do that, um, if, you, if you wish. So you could first uh, take the diff der derivative, so you could differentiate the ODE with respect to the parameters. That will give you a different ODE. Or, and, and then you, know, you can discretize that, that ODE if you like. Or you can first discretize your ODE, say with the forward order method or whatever method you want, and then differentiate whatever discretization you get. So there are two, I mean, there are two subtle differences, but they've been debated for decades in the optimal control community. So, um, and they have different properties. So let's look at the first one. So it's called first differentiate, then discretize. So you keep everything to be continuous in time, theta b, y's, everything. Then there's something called the Euler-Lagrange equation, which is kind of an optimality condition in the end for you. Um, and that, that also involves then what is called the adjoint equation. So I will refer to our ResNet as the forward equation, or the forward solve, or forward propagation, I should probably say. And then the adjoint equation always goes backward in time. And that is very much related to backprop. Backprop actually is one specific instance of, of the adjoint equation, I, I would argue. Um, so anyway, you have then two eight equations to, to solve, and I'll show you this one in this, in this next slide. And then you could pick an ODE solver for the forward propagation, and you can pick an ODE solver for the adjoint equation. And if both are solved with very good tolerance, that will give you a gradient. If any of them is not solved with a good tolerance, that gradient may be useless. So that is kind of the cloudy version here. Like um, you have to solve both of them actually quite well to get a good gradient out. But then after after doing this, you can just use uh, some new, some optimization like a gradient descent, stochastic gradient descent, or whatever to to get the loss down. Um, so the nice thing and why people sometimes like this is that they have the flexibility to choose any ODE solver for the forward equation and any ODE solver for the adjoint equation, any one that makes sense. 
Um, so in, in the neural ODE kind of pa papers and following that, that's the approach taken. So you use a black box ODE solver for the forward and a black box ODE solver for the adjoint. And they may not have the same time steps. Uh, actually, most, uh, mostly uh, in their examples, the adjoint is easier to solve because it's linearized and you have fewer time steps for that. So then you could save some time um, but, uh, in comparison to the forward propagation. On the other end, that's, um, is you flip these two things. So you discretize everything in time. You can use different time grids for different quantities, but you come up with a discretization of an ODE. And then, okay, you want to make it like reasonably accurate maybe, if you are, especially if you believe in the ODE. If you don't believe in the ODE, don't make it too accurate. In this case, I don't know if, you, if, if I should believe in, in the ODE that I've written down. It's not like physics. I mean, you can, there's some slack in here. And then you differentiate really that objective that you get out. So for example, here you would apply automatic differentiation. Automatic differentiation has not so much uh, to do with, with the other approach. There the idea is really to be smart and work out the adjoints and then discretize the adjoints. You wouldn't use AD for that. Um, but here you, you can think about you, you differentiate through the ODE solver. Um, that's what you would do here. Um, so that can be good or bad. So the gradients uh, can, be, uh, can be related to adjoints, but uh, not always. So for some cases, like forward Euler is one example, where it doesn't really matter. So the, ad the discrete adjoint that you get out is actually a good discretization also for the real adjoint. But there are some cases for more difficult problems with shocks or so, where, where this is not always a, a good thing. Um, and the gradient here is always useful. So you will always get a gradient to uh, about machine precision, even if you don't solve the ODE well. Um, so that is, is one thing. So we are in this camp here really for that reason because um, I'm not tied so much to the, to the continuous object. Why do I want to spend so much time solving it well? Uh, I don't know, but I want to get a good gradient for what I, what, for what I have here. Um, so, and that allows, uh, it allows you to have fewer time steps, and each time step here is costly, because each time step involves maybe convolutions and whatever you want to have. Um, okay, so if you look at the adjoint equation, in a very simplified setting, so you have the loss function that depends on the final state, and you have your ODE constraint here. Then the adjoint equation looks like looks like so. So you have um, the gradient. So that's what you're interested in. You want the, the loss differentiated to the theta at time t, and you get that by taking a vector product with the Jacobian of f, which is your your right hand side here of the ODE with respect to Z of T. And then Z of T is what's called the adjoint state. So Z of T is a, new, is a new character here in the game. And Z of T satisfies a linearized ODE that goes backward in time. So this ODE here, always, uh, this depends on the Jacobian with respect to Y. And you integrate that back from time. So at time one, you have a final time condition. And then you go back to time zero. And that is just the gradient of your loss with respect to the, f the, the output features. So, um, and I mean, if, you, if you're interested, I mean, I can show you how I derived this, but it's uh, like not so, no it's, it's quite standard calculus here to, to get there. What's interesting here is, first of all, um, I mean, the forward propagation, of course, goes forward in time. This adjoint, I need to solve the adjoint in order to get my gradient that I'm interested in, and I need to do that backward in time. And so here you have this thing that is very much similar to backpropagation, as Frank has described it in his, in his tutorials. Um, here is one thing to highlight, namely that the Jacobian here, in general, will depend on the y at time t. So that's my hidden state. Okay? And same for this one and for this one. So it, it, uh, it always um, involves this, uh, this, this y of t, which means that not only do I have to solve this forward propagation, but I need to kind of keep the hidden features for the back propagation. So if you are using back propagation for your first time in TensorFlow and you realize that the memory of your GPU runs out, that is the reason why. Because um, no matter what you do, if you do automatic differentiation or if you want to solve an adjoint, there's no way around having these available when you do the back propagation. 
Okay, that doesn't mean you have, always have to store them. You could also recompute them or do other smart things. Um, but if you don't do anything, that is the reason why your, your GPU runs out. Um, and again, I mean, like for in the other regimes of first discretize and differentiate, um, you basically have similar flavors. So there's no free lunch here, really. Um, but memory wise, that is a big obstacle here. Um, um, here's some, something else, some idea from optimal control that uh, we've been using quite a lot for ResNets. So uh, how, how many of you think that initializing a neural network is easy? Okay, how many uh, think it's hard? Okay, me too. Um, so if you, if, you, if you do that, especially if you have a very big model, I mean, who knows how to, how to, how to, how to uh, initialize these things. So with the ResNet now, since we can relate it to a dynamical system, we could think about starting small, learning something, and then improve. And that's kind of the idea of multi-level learning. So you start with a ResNet that has, say, n layers. And has, so, you know, time step would be h is equal to t over n. You initialize randomly, then you train that network. You get a solution, maybe, or some approximate solution. And now you could say you double the number of, uh, this should be probably, I oh know, this should, should be good. So you double the number of time steps, you have the step size, you have a new ResNet now. And now you need to initialize that new ResNet. So what, what do you think you can do? You can do something called prolongation in time, which is a fancy way of saying you interpolate. So if I had a layer at this time point, OK, I keep the weights. And if I didn't have a layer, I look who are my neighbors, and I take an average, and then, then I go. OK, or use any fifth order polynomial in time to do some interpolation here, whatever you want to believe in. Um, but that's what you do. And then you keep, keep, keep doing this. So you increase the power of your model, or the number of weights at least, um, but in a somewhat systematic way. And now it comes actually also to the question of optimization, where I'm probably an outlier, because I'm not always tied to SGD and this variance. If you are in, like in, in regular optimization methods, like full batch think, even full batch steepest descent, although I like Gauss-Newton better, um, then you actually have a guarantee that if you have a descent method, that you will improve here. Not so much for SGD, because if you initialize SGD at the true minimum, it may still diverge away, because uh, there are learning rates and, and stuff like that. Um, but, but so in optimal control, these methods have been very popular, and uh, they've also been used in, uh, in, um, in machine learning now these days. OK, let's touch about um, stability here. Um, so one of the, the um, claims that we still have, and uh, we've, we've seen anecdotes of that come through, is that when you do machine learning, um, then you have a few things that you need to do, and the choices you make depend on it or, or are interdependent. So one thing is the modeling. So you want to define a neural network, um, and you want to, say, discretize that neural network. Now, if you think about ODE-based neural networks, and then you want to optimize its, its weights. And from op in optimal control applications, it's, it's known that these jobs are very related. So if, if your model is the heat equation, you may have a different optimization method than if your model is a wave equation. Um, and if you have a good discretization of your, of your PDE, you may have an easier time in the optimization than if you have a bad discretization of your ODE. So there are you know, these interdependencies that, that are quite known that are not so much if you look at the current mode of research in machine learning. Because you have some people who design architectures, and then you have other people who write papers about optimization for those architectures. But the choice of how this architecture is being made should influence your optimization and vice versa. And probably after Patrick's talk, there should be a fourth uh, pillar here, which is uh, how you actually, what is actually the data that you put in. So that's been in my node space so far. So that will be added at some point. But my expectation would be that all these tasks are somewhat related. Um, and if, so I did my PhD in, 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 in inverse problems. So how many of you know what an inverse problem is? Great. So I don't need to talk too much about what is an inverse problem then. But in an inverse problem, if you read inverse problems papers, then the first thing, I mean, we don't talk, typically even don't talk about it anymore, is that we say that the forward problem is well posed. 
If your forward problem is not well posed, you don't solve the inverse problem. You have an early, you have an early day, uh, day out. I mean, you can just go home. Um, and then another thing that we like is when the inverse is also bounded in some sense. Um, so uh, basically, our first uh, idea back then was to look at how this holds for, for machine learning. I'm probably going to skip over this one in the lack of time. So this is just an example to show you that you can have nice lost landscapes and not, not nice, nice lost landscapes, sorry, um, depending on how well you solve your ODE, okay? Um, so that's not so, in, not, not so interesting. Mm -hmm. You, you uh, can poke me later too. So if you look at ODEs now, which are forward propagations, so Steve uh, did a great job with much nicer videos here. I have uh, very primitive videos, so I have unstable initial value problems. It's one category, so I have two dots that are close together, and um, they kind of deviate from each other very quickly. Translate that to a machine learning problem now. So Y0 here are my input features to the neural net. That means that if I perturb my input features just a, by a tiny bit for this neural network, I will get, end up in very drastically different places after the forward propagation. May not be such a great idea. I mean, it's a great idea if you're an adversary who tries to fool the neural network, but it's not so much a nice, it's not a good defense uh, strategy. On the other hand, there are very stable initial value problems. So here's one. So you have two points and opposite corners here, and they all get pulled into the, into the origin, which is zero in this case. I'd argue. I mean, of course, it's, it's much more robust against attacks. I mean, it doesn't really matter where you put your, I mean, in, in some sense, it doesn't really matter where you put your point. Everything will be zero in the end, which is also tells you that you shouldn't integrate the ODE for too long in time or make your network too deep in that sense. Um, and it's a nightmare in terms of the learning, because now the, class, the poor classifier um, has very little ac sensitivity to deal with in the end, because everything al almost looks like the same. So we want to be in the middle here. Um, and yeah, I save you the, the formal definition here. Um, and uh, here's another plot where you, know, you can show also like with, with, with force fields, like how, how these three dynamics in this case look like. And you may want to be in a, in a regime like so. So this is, this is a really stable, but not too stable regime. And, and, um, and here, basically, all the, the distances get preserved. Um, so I don't know, quick review. If you have an ODE, so this time it's a, it's a nonlinear ODE, and it's not uh, time dependent, um, then you want to look at the eigenvalues of the Jacobian. You want to look at the real parts of those, take a look at their signs. If they are positive, then this means stuff is growing. So it's not stable. If they're negative, then things are stable. Okay? I think Steve had a few examples like that too on his slides. So let's look for a very simple setting on a ResNet. So you have a ResNet and the weights are stationary, so they are the same at each layer. And I picked the simplest ma model I could find, so it's just a single layer here. And then the Jacobians of that look like, so you have a pointwise activation, so that gives you a diagonal matrix. That, if, that has the weights of, um, or that has the um, derivatives of the activations, and then you multiply this thing by k. So if you look at this as a Jacobian, so this guy here will be a diagonal matrix, and the entries, entries will be non-negative for most activations that you have, like 10H is not, not going down, it's monotonic, ReLU is monotonic, um, um, and then you have this k here. It's not fair, I think, to assume that the forward propagation should be stable, for this, for even for this simple case. I mean, now you can look in your linear algebra book and go through all the different cases, what you may have, and it's not so, so clear that without, remember the k is what's going to be chosen by the optimization, um, that you will have a stable architecture. Yeah? Um, is y your weight matrix? No, uh, k is my weight matrix. Yeah. But I take the Jacobian with respect to y. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so like if you if you look at um, the stand, standard thing. So uh, at this stage here, I mean, you will have a hard time figuring out what k should I pick in order to be stable, and the optimizer will also have a hard time doing so. So you have now a few options. 
Um, so first of all, you could, this is a simplified argument. If you want to have non-stationary weights, things become even more complicated. Um, but uh, now one idea is, can we make, can we change this function here so that we are stable for all, cho all choices of weights? Okay? Um, and there are a few things you can do. So one thing is you can replace the k here by k minus k transpose. Okay, so that kills all the real parts of the eigenvalues. And that actually leads to this kind of plot here. Okay, so that's kind of a tough, sometimes a tough sell for me. It's a very hard restriction now on your architecture. But on the, on the flip side, if this works, which means if you can train it and if, if you can, uh, can fit your data and generalize and all that, then you have a forward propagation that is absolutely stable. So that, uh, um, that is much more informed than the, the other one. And then the other idea could be, so you can, in, so this is in, enforcing some anti-symmetry. And you can also do this by, by the following design. So you, say you split your features into, into two parts. And then you have a K acting on the second part and a minus K transpose acting on the first part. So these are um, very similar to when you look into Hamiltonian uh, dynamics. Um, you, you see those kind of ODEs coming out. And then, of course, the, sensitiv I mean, the stability analysis also goes like, um, this guy only has imaginary eigenvalues. Even if you multiply it with a, with a positive diagonal matrix, uh, you are in good shape here. OK, so who thinks it's a great idea to now use, um, I mean, now the continuous problem is, is safe, right? Continuous problem is stable. We are, we have a, we've done a great job. So now we need to go to TensorFlow, PyTorch, whatever. Who thinks that we should just take this layer function and, and, and put it in there? No one. That's good. Because you realize your, I mean, you, you remember your first numerical methods lecture on dynamical systems. And you imagine a, or you remember a plot like this, right? It's a stability region of a forward Euler method. So you look at some of the eigenvalues of the Jacobians again, and they, you want to be, you want to scale them so that you are in this, this little ball. And we just made sure by design that we are on this axis. Okay, so don't just use a standard ResNet if you, if you use these stable layers, but flip to the next page. Uh, for example, flip to what's called the Bashforth family of multi-step methods or something like that. Or use a, a higher order single step methods like a Runge-Kutta method or something like that. Those capture the area that you're interested in. And so here you have a new discovery here. You can write a new paper about, an, uh, an, uh, we have to give it a name other than ResNet because it's not a ResNet anymore. It goes back like th uh, two time steps and it has these fancy weights of you know 23 over 12 and minus 16 over 12 um, that you will not find in a machine learning uh, framework implemented already. Um, but this now here would be um, uh, an architecture that carries over the stability from the continuous model to the discrete level if you have a sufficiently small time steps, I should say. Um, okay, and you can keep going. So for the other one, where we had this anti-symmetric, um, uh, sorry, where we had this Hamiltonian-like dynamic, you open the book and you go to symplectic integrators, like relay type integration. So here you have the Z, you have a, sorry, you have a half step, you have a Z that gets updated through the layer acting on the Ys, and the Y that gets updated through the acting on the Zs at the half step. This one is nice because it's, first of all, it's a stable way to integrate that ODE. But if you look at it, you have a new property here that might come in handy. Namely, if I gave you the last two, um, like the last Y and the last Z, I could go backward in time. Okay? So I could flip these guys around. And I start with, with the last uh, instances of these vector, vectors, and I go backward in time. So why, why would that be cool? That would be cool because I have to keep no memory whatsoever when I want to do backprop. Because in the backprop, I could recompute uh, the states. OK, that uh, costs you a few flops, but many machine learning problems are memory bound and not compute bound. Um, 
and you could recompute those states, and this now is a stable way to recompute them. So if you look um, into papers that say, I have a general ODE, and I can just flip the sign of the nonlinearity and integrate it backward in time, that is known not to work for many ODEs out there. You have to be extremely lucky to uh, make this work in a stable way. This one is a stable way of doing this. Um, and so, so this, this idea here is kind of related to what's called the RevNet, if anyone has heard of that. Um, that basically has also um, constructs a network with, with Y's and Z's and then they update each other. And then algebraically you can reverse this, this forward propagation. Numerically, different story sometimes. And um, um, I don't know, uh, are people using RevNets here? Okay, um, so since there is someone who has used the RevNet, um, we, can, we can ask the question, so is any algebraically reversible network also reversible in practice? Um, and the answer to those kind of questions always is no, right? No. So here's an example. So you pick a very simple way where you have, um, so the F is, is what's um, acting uh, on the Ys and the G is what's acting on the, on the, on the Z and they are just scaling the features by alpha or beta. No nonlinearity, no fine transformation, just some scaling, okay? But to make a point. So then you see that the Z gets updated by minus alpha times uh, yj, and the Y gets updated by beta times, or gets added at beta times Z at the half step. Okay, so that could be a forward propagation through a RevNet with very simple choice of weights. Um, so if you combine these two steps and do some, some algebra, so you combine uh, two steps in Y, then subtract, so that's a kind of differential equation 101. So you subtract, you end up with an equation like so. So you have a YJ, a YJ plus one minus uh, this, this stuff here um, times YJ plus YJ minus one has to be equal to zero. And then you know that there's a solution that, is, that you can write as you know, xi to the j. And the coefficients here are determined by solving this quadratic equation that has all the coefficients in there. And turns out that, so you want this xi, I think the absolute value you want to be between, minus, uh, between zero and one. Because think about when you take j to be big, you exponentiate this thing and you will become unstable if that's bigger. And that I think only holds um, when a squared is less or equal to, to one, so a being this kind of guy. So that means that if you are unlucky and your learned weights don't satisfy this equation, then the, um, I mean, either forward or, or backward, things may, may, may explode because you also don't want this side to be too small in magnitude because that means that you will dampen all the y's expo uh, quite fast. Um, and then in the, in the backward solve, you will probably have a hard time if you have some numerical error or so, things will, things will blow up. So you want this, this to be actually equal to one because then forward and backward you have stability. And that is uh, kind of one of the design mechanisms of the Hamiltonian uh, or symplectic integrators. Um, okay, so here's um, maybe a, 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 a tiny example to show how or if the, the learning performance depends on which discretization you pick. Um, and this is a cooked up example. So we made up this, uh, this example here um, where we have uh, five classes and they are not uh, so disjoint and a little bit interesting to look at, but it's 2D feature space. So I like that a lot because then I can actually look at what the classifier is doing in the end. Uh, we also work on bigger data sets and for tomorrow, but uh, there is very hard sometimes to figure out if you did a good job or not. So here I'll throw in a few things. So we'll use a ResNet, I'll use uh, a multi-level idea. So I start with 32 layers, then I prolongate the weights and I go to 64 layers in the hope of um, you know, being faster, but also sometimes in image processing or so, people do this to avoid local minima. Um, and I have yeah, like three cases. So the first I call unstable. So I have a very large T, which is uh, the whole length of my interval. 
Um, and I use only 32 two time steps, so it's kind of a lo longer time step. Then I have a medium, so I make this smaller. Um, and I have a uh, like a really stable one, so very short time to learn, okay? Um, and I use a very good uh, time integrator for that. So this is the history from my optimizer um, for this unstable case, okay? So you see here that uh, I have an objective function. The objective function oh, it goes up and down. Maybe people are used to that. I mean, sometimes happens. Um, and then you are, you are finally, you've got the, the objective function down quite a bit. You go to the next uh, um, level. You see, first of all, the big uptake here that is very irritating. Because I think my selling point was, after you've trained on the 32, you have learned something that is useful. <laughs> Not so much here. And it's probably intuitively clear why. Because the time steps here are so large that that object is not very closely related to the ODE. And that is the thing that pulls, that keeps together both the 32 and the 64 layers instances here. But anyway, you know, you get some OK validation accuracy here, um, maybe about 90%. But it's not a success story here. This is really a, a, a huge failure and a predictable failure because deliberately we made the architecture unstable. Um, and by the way, so this is not an SGD plot here. I should say that. This is a, um, like something like a Gauss-Newton method, but with cheating. So in a Gauss-Newton method, you typically do a line search ensuring the objective goes down. Here, we had such a hard time with the line search failing. So we said, OK, if the line search fails, it doesn't matter, just go. So that's why you see those upticks. Because what is the point in uh, going home after five iterations not having solved the problem? Uh, but it's really a problem here. This was a hack, and we had to do this hack because we had the instability uh, in, in the architecture. Okay, so let's do a little bit better job. So this is when you, um, first of all, you use this valet integration, so it's a stable architecture, um, and you um, do the same thing. So you learn very, very well, I'd say. So no hack needed. But you don't really generalize across the uh, number of time steps. Um, but ultimately, you, you are able to solve the problem here. And this is what happens if you have a really good time integrator here. So if you have small time steps, then basically you, ha you have already solved the problem at 32, uh, with 32 layers. If, you then, um, if, if this is a, a good discretization of the final ODE and you add more time steps, then you shouldn't do worse. So that's what you want to see. Um, OK. And I want to show you the dynamics that, that are learned here. Because there was a point in going into 2D feature space, with the caveat of me only showing you the first two dimensions of whatever features we have. Um, that's, uh, just, that's just the way it, it has to be here for, for videos. Um, so here's the dynamics so after the training that we get from the unstable network. So this box here depicted the original support of the, of the feature space. So that's a nice transformation, no? I mean, like, um, remember, the goal of the transformation is to make um, this point cloud here separable. And I, I would argue that we achieved that goal. Let me pause here for a second. So here, if you have like these lines go through with some fantasy, I mean, you can have a decent job of, of, of classifying. Is that very stable? No, probably not. I mean, probably all the hyperplanes are almost parallel uh, to one another. Um, but yeah, that's the solution that you could that you could expect here. On the other hand, if you have this um, valet type integration, then you more or less stay in the box. I mean, you leave a little bit, but in the end, um, kind of you you the network pulls its act together and um, basically you are separable. I mean, I stopped it a little bit early, so the, the final one looks a little bit better. Um, and this one is almost too boring to show you. And also, since we only show the first two dimensions, maybe it's not the interesting one. So there's only a very subtle m motion here that is being done um, by the network. And these are the landscapes, then, of the classifier that I get out. So that here, to, this, to make this picture, uh, I basically use an, an equally spaced pixel grid propagated it forward and pr pr print the whole thing as an image. So that allows you to see, for example, um, that in here where, where you have no data, you don't generalize very well. 
because that shouldn't be red. And though in the true image, uh, the true image looks almost indistinguishable from this one. That's why I didn't put it here. Um, and you also see that, I mean, if you sit in the front row, you may see some, some weird pink shades in here um, that are not supposed to be in that region. So that is pr makes you prone to an adversarial attack because you, the distance to the decision boundary is not very large here. Whereas you become better when you have more, when you have more time steps. Uh, um, yeah? I was just wondering, how is, how is the, um, in the stable case, how, how is the linear classifier um, getting the, the categories? Because we, we didn't see the, the blobs separated. In this one here? Right, yeah, on, on the right. Ah, um, so true? this one is not the valet integration, so it, it acts in 4D. No, I mean the, um, the stable one, the one on the right hand side. Yeah. The, it, the, the blobs didn't like, yeah. separate from each other. I don't know. Classifying well. I, I don't know, to be honest, but I picked four dimensions here as a feature space, okay. and I'm showing you two. Got it. So 4D. So something's happening in this section. I mean, must have been. I mean, if you, if you saw from the from the previous plot here, um, like this was almost uh, too easy to solve. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Um, can you relate stability to adversarial attacks? I think I can. Like back of, it, of the envelope definition here. So in an adversarial attack, I mean there are, there are different adversarial attacks, of course, but it is an adversary. So say you have a feature like here, and you want to fool the classifier, and you could think about fooling the classifier by adding a perturbation to that data point. So then um, you want to go from here. That basically, you solve an optimization problem for the minimal perturbation so that you reach a decision boundary, right? Um, so, so that means that you perturb the, ini so in, in, in our framework now, so you perturb the initial state of the ODE to achieve a certain output in the classifier. If your ODE is, is very stable, then you need to add a large perturbation to really change the last output that gets seen by the classifier. If I it stable here, is it saying that you related to like every point has to have a large thing or on average the change ah. needed? Like what's that, what's that criteria or? So uh, maybe I do show the formal definition for, for just a bit. So that's the definition that we mostly work with. So when you have one feature and you perturb the input state here, by some epsilon times v. You then forward propagate to time big T, and you look at the difference. So that difference should be somewhat proportional to the size of the perturbation that you have applied. Does that have to be true for every y0, or? That's what we would hope, yes. I mean, that's kind of what in our design principles, like this relay type architecture, will satisfy that. And we have proved those of our other types of architectures we've produced that the distance here is actually um, not going up, at least. You could also relate this to Lipschitz constant. So basically, the Lipschitz constant, you want to be one or less of the whole network. And that's something we satisfy by design. OK. Yeah. So we're related, and we still have to draw boundaries somewhere in your space, right? So there's always going to be points where an epsilon difference will change. Yes, yeah. So I mean, is there some like, rationale for where those, besides generalization, like in terms of adversarial, where those boundaries make sense, where an epsilon difference changes class? Uh, maybe that I mean you know you have to make it you have to draw a line someplace, and maybe my my naive argument now would be to say well maybe in your feet maybe that's the properties of your features. If your feature gets measured here, it gets assigned this label, and if it gets pushed over there, it gets a different label. And maybe it's just an ambiguous example, almost. So there is no cure that I can that we have for that. I mean you have to make a decision somehow, and that decision is made by the optimizer that optimizes a very rough 
idea, a very rough objective function of what you actually want to achieve, which is learning. So there's a discrepancy between learning and optimization also that sometimes gets lost. Optimization is just a means to an end in, in these, in these uh, scenarios. Um, okay, so where were we? So, okay. Yeah, so these are just more examples. So maybe this one is kind of nice. It's kind of, we call it the Swiss roll example. So you have uh, two D feature space, two classes. It's a simple gateway problem. And uh, you can use a, um, like multi-level idea. So go start with only two layers, see what you get, improve, um, and go to 1024. And these are just different architectures and how they, how they tackle the problem. So the blue one here is a ResNet, and the other ones are, are other architectures that we cooked in the stability. Um, and uh, oftentimes what we see is that we um, have an easier time in the optimization in those cases. And to expose that, so easier time in the optimization is sometimes very hard to judge if you have stochastic schemes. We typically try to use uh, Newton's CG methods, for, at least for these toy examples, where you have a much more predictable uh, descent. Um, okay, so I have like 10 more minutes. So let me show you one more newer thing that, that we've been doing in that area. Um, so here's, here's um, one idea that is very popular in optimal control of dynamical systems. It's called parallel in time methods. Um, and we've applied that to training a neural network. So if you think about a, a neural network, um, not in the, what, we, what I call the reduced formulation. So you solve your ODE, you plug in the solution into your loss function, but you keep the ODE as a constraint. If you do that, you end up with a giant problem. So you have your loss function that is um, on the last time step of your ODE. And then as, a, as constraints, you have basically your forward propagation. So Y1 is Y0 plus F of Y0 and so on. And so, okay. Everyone, of course, goes immediately to the reduced form, and there is some beauty to that. But we just had the question, okay, so what if we don't? What if we really solve this, what is called the full space or the all-at-once uh, formulation of the optimization problem? Um, and um, I mean, just as a, re as a recall, so like this constraint, you can eliminate the constraint with, a, say, a forward Euler method. And that is a sequential process, but you know, you can do it. Uh, however, when you stay in the full space, the idea is maybe you can do parallel computing and parallel computing now through the layers. So that is a form of parallelism that you oftentimes don't have in, in standard neural network trainings um, and uh, maybe there are use cases. So, so this is one of the hammers that I mentioned on Wednesday. Um, so let's see how that goes in a, in a simple problem. So if you have... Um, a linear dynamics, and you integrate it with forward Euler, you could write this as a linear system. So the y1 here is basically y0, um, and then y2 would be, um, so y2 would be uh, this whole, whole stuff times y1, and so on. Um, if you look at this, this is a lower triangle linear system, very band limited. So clearly, you, you, you know that optimal complexity would be to use a forward substitution. But if you do forward substitution, it's a sequential process. So the alternative to that could be to say, hey, I have a linear system. The linear system is sparse. Let's use an iterative solver. Sounds like a really dumb idea. Um, because it's, of course, much higher complexity, but it is I mean, inherently parallel, because you only need to do matrix vector products. OK? So now the question is, who wins? So if you carry around your laptop, I think the forward propagation would be my recommendation. But if you uh, say Google, or you sit in a national lab, and you have a supercomputer, then maybe you know, the, other, the, the second regime here may, may win, especially if you pair it now with what's called multigrid in time. So that goes roughly like so. So you have uh, red dots and you have uh, black dashes. So this is your time grid here, and this is a time step of age. And every so many time steps, you bundle together and you put a red dot. 
And now the idea is you do a, a hybrid between one extreme and the other. So you could do a forward substitution on this interval um, and, and forward substitution on this interval and forward substitution on this interval. And at those points here, you now have a constraint that whatever you get from the left equals to what you have from the right. So there's the communication that's happening. So you break down the forward substitutions into those small intervals, and then you somehow, with constraint optimization, you force them into an equilibrium. Uh, there's been a lot of work in the scientific computing community on making this work for optimal control problems involving dynamic systems. Um, um, and yeah, so we've, we've applied that to very simple learning problems. And um, just to, to show you, so there's more in this paper. And um, actually, uh, Stephanie is also close by here. So if someone is interested, then she might be someone uh, to, to invite down here. Um, so this is um, a strong scaling plot. So you, have, um, you add the number of, of, of layers here in your network. And um, then you add also more cores to the computation. And you see those vertical, uh, those horizontal lines here. These are called the crossover points. So if you have, um, for this one here, for example, is 256 layers. And if you have less than 16 cores, then you win with a sequential mode. But if you have more cores than, say, 32, you win with a parallel forward integration. So this is just a forward propagation, or forward and adjoint, so forward and, gr and gradient. Um, and this is much more different when you have, say, 2,000 layers, then there's almost uh, no, I mean, you almost immediately win with, with a parallel in, in layer forward propagation. Now you can add a second idea, actually. Um, so, and this is a trick very commonly used in optimal control, that you don't need to solve your constraint very well in each iteration, because you update the, the network weights and you update now the hidden states. And they, the hidden states don't always have to be uh, played by the rules of the constraint when the network weights are not, not chosen well yet. So you have, can do simultaneous optimization on both of them. And then you can actually get quite nice uh, speed ups. Um, uh, so this is a runtime, and that is kind of a training loss. And surprisingly, um, even though this is not in, in an SGD framework, um, you actually generalize fairly well in those cases that, that we've looked at. Um, so that is, that is one work that we've done very recently. So you could use, for example, this as if you have an SGD. Um, so it's just an, another means of, of doing parallelism. So I think the data parallelism, I mean, of course, is, is the most efficient thing you can do, and you should if you can. But say if you have really large data sets, and you can fit only one of them uh, into a computer, but not into not with the whole deep network that you have, then that might be a nice option. Um, okay, some conclusions, and then maybe we have some time for more questions. Um, so, first mission for me was relating optimal control and, and deep deep learning. Um, uh, my the goal in that is to get more insight, maybe get some more theory into why some networks work and some don't. And ultimately, I think, make algorithms. So make algorithms that are kind of a little bit simpler to use and tune, because in an ODE, there are only so many things that you need to pick, like time steps and, uh, and step sizes. Um, but also to look into the stability and well-posedness of the whole learning problem. Um, so I strongly recommend using di first discretize and differentiate, because you can use fewer time steps and still get good gradients. Um, but there's also some impact of your choices on the optimization. Um, then we did some numerical methods. And if you are interested, we're meeting tomorrow again. And then we talk about PDEs. So PDEs you get by saying that your feature space has an additional structure. And in images, typically that, that structure has been studied a lot. Like if you think about image processing, there's a link to PDE-based image processing. And that is uh, now, now one of the stories that you can mimic here with, with deep neural networks. OK? And tomorrow there will be less videos, but more pictures. Cool. Mm. And I should acknowledge these guys who have done most of the work. <laughs>